Your support helps us bring you programs you love. Go to wyomingpbs.org, click on support, and become a sustaining member or an annual member. It's easy and secure. Thank you. Welcome to Wyoming PBS's Capital Outlook. I'm your host, Craig Blumenshine. Tonight, we'll preview the 2018 budget session of the Wyoming Legislature, and we'll begin with conversations with the President of the Senate, Senator Eli Bebout, and the Speaker of the House, Representative Steve Harshman. We'll also visit with the Legislature's representatives of the Wyoming Government Efficiency Study Commission, that's Senator Drew Perkins and Representative Joe McGuire. We'll share a profile of Senator Michael Von Flatern from Gillette. And then finally, we'll hear from the minority leaders of the Wyoming Legislature, Senator Chris Rothfuss and Representative Kathy Connolly. Capital Outlook starts now. This program is supported in part by a grant from the BNSF Railway Foundation, dedicated to improving the general welfare and quality of life in communities throughout the BNSF Railway Service Area. Proud to support Wyoming PBS. And in part by the Wyoming Public Television Endowment and viewers like you. And we welcome our viewers to our first full Capital Outlook of the season. And it's our pleasure to again be joined by the leadership of the Wyoming Legislature. Senate President Eli Bebout and Representative Steve Harshman, the Speaker of the House. Gentlemen, welcome back Good to Capital Outlook. A lot of issues to talk about, certainly not only for this budget session, but as we kind of get started today and give a preview to our viewers about what's coming down the road. And I think education's about on everyone's mind. And let's start right there. You both um, understand that the state just went through a recalibration process where you looked again at how education's funded. I sense maybe that you both may not 100% agree on how education should move forward, and I kind of want to start talking about that. Mr. President, let's, let's start with you. Um, we went through recalibration. It was, this particular effort was rejected by the committee unanimously, yet they said that there was still some good work done, but we still have an issue now maybe of some future deficit funding for education. Well, what's, what's the I, I way forward? I think the spin is that there's always some good that comes out of anything, and I think that's probably accurate in this case, and the speaker of course, is on that committee, and he's a lot more knowledgeable about the inner workings of it. You know, I just wanted to be able to try to, in my own mind, answer some of the questions of my constituents where, where we spend, you know, a considerable amount more money per ADM for our children, and the results are good, but they're maybe not as good as we should expect, and why do other states spend so much less? And just that basic question. But more than that, you know, it's just to look at the whole funding scenario, and, you know, out of adversity comes opportunity, and there's some meaningful reforms we can do relative to our funding package, then we ought to take a look at that. And Mr. President, let me interrupt you just for a moment because you've talked about that in the past year. You talked about responsible cuts, and we now have essentially, in my eyes, two sets of consultants that said, you know, education Wyoming should cost about what it is. What are you thinking about when you talk about responsible cuts? Well, what I'm talking about in the sense of that, and by the way, the education community and the legislature working together and I think the number is maybe, what, 4.4% or something, the reductions that we've had to the, the foundation program. And when I look at it, I take a bigger, broader perspective in terms of what we can afford. And, you know, it's a matter of that rather than just what the courts tell us to do. And so I'm a, I'm a proponent of maybe the legislature should be the ones that decide how much we spend rather than the courts dictating that. Of course, that's not the situation we have. But when we look at responsible things that we should do, there's a lot of things within the formula itself that I think need to be adjusted. You know, I, I'm for one are, are strong on small school districts. We need that small school district adjust, adjustment. I think that's part of it. But you know, we have different things on the insurance, how we pay for insurance in the model, but yet they don't have any people that are insured. We have the ro three year rolling average issue. We have those kinds of things. Then classroom size. You know, I'm a proponent of having small classroom size in K through three. I think that's a good thing. But as we go to the, the secondary education part of it up in the high schools, maybe we should have larger classroom size. The thing that upsets me a little bit about how we do the classroom size is we've had, we've dictated to have smaller classrooms, but some school districts are going larger and then and not hiring the teachers to have the kind of classroom size we might need so they could pay more money to the teacher, then that's the thing and the problem with a block grant. 
So there's just different issues in the whole foundation program that I think need to be discussed, and I look forward to working with the House. The Speaker knows a lot more about this than I do, just to see if there's some common ground that we can do to continue to provide the funds we need for these kids, to give them an opportunity in this world climate they have to exist in, yet to be able to do something in the levels that I think we can afford. Mr. Speaker, you summarized to the group yesterday that, that with the work the Joint Appropriations Committee has done, we've maybe found our way forward for the next biennium. What did you mean by that, and what are your what's your vision now on what needs to happen in this session relative to education? Well, I think, you know, and I don't want to, uh, there's a couple things going on in Wyoming education, and it's and it's really gone through the constitutional process for the last 35 years with the Washke cases and the recent Campbell decisions. And the bottom line is it's about equity, right? That's the first thing. Should a kid in Du Bois have the same opportunities as a kid in Campbell County in Gillette? And the uh, Constitution is very clear on that. It's the state's wealth, not the local wealth in Du Bois or or uh, Matici or anything else. And so those kids are all citizens. The state of Wyoming should have that equity piece. Costs money. 330 schools in this state. Uh, if we were gonna run this like a business, we might have 230. I mean, we'd bust more kids. We probably wouldn't keep our alma maters at Midwest and, and uh, Shoshone open. We just wouldn't. I mean, if you were totally brought in hardcore business and said that, uh, but I think the legislature has taken the policy for the last 30 years that uh, we're not going to shut down small town Wyoming. I mean, if you don't have your, if your school goes, it's over. And I think there's some other structural things in Wyoming that, because you drive through Nebraska or South Dakota, they've closed those schools. They've all unified with the next town. Unified Absolutely. school districts. Absolutely. Yep. And uh, Wyoming's a little different than that, <clears throat> partly the way we fund, but uh, Partly we're a little more spread out too. It's not 10 miles apart on some of these. But so to, to really see that though, it, it's a block grant. All that we, we analyze is the most analyzed system in the world. And districts are about 90% congruent with, with, cause it's a cost based model. That's what they study. How much does it cost to provide this equitable education? So are we going to have more cuts? I think that's the bottom line. Our viewers are, are, are looking at this tonight and they're, they're wondering, okay, but we've had these two consultants come back and say, we're spending about the right amount of money. Do you perceive that in this session there might be some more cuts and, and are, are there folks that are working on that? I think that, you know, without getting into the, the, the consultant's report and, and I know that the committee voted 10 to nothing to, to, to not to do anything with it. And I'm not going to go there. there. I think there's a lot of problems with that report. I think there's an opportunity to have some good discussion about it. Can I predict? No, I don't know what will happen. That's the process we'll go through. I think the Senate will still take the position that we need to look at some reforms and measures of, of how we fund education. I think that's out there. It's on the table. Uh, and I think there will, be, there will be issues and discussions about that. As to where the Senate ends up going, we'll see. Stay tuned on that one. And then if the Senate should have something in that regard, then I look forward to, to working with the House and see what happens. You know, last session we had some differences, but at the end of the day, we came together on a, on a compromise that nobody liked, but yet everybody felt good about. So I'm optimistic, you know, things, is, we're not doom and gloom, you know, things are looking up. We can be proud of what we've done in the past in Wyoming, K through 12, as well as everything else. So we're in a great position to be able to move forward on this. Thank goodness, and when Steve and I were co-chairs of the, of the JAC, you know, we recognized that the boom would bust. It wasn't a matter of if, but when. And we were set aside these funds to get us through these lean times. So we're, we're set up to do it. Now is the time to take advantage, though, of maybe there's a better way to do some of these things. We're going to talk a little more about that in just a minute, but Mr. Speaker, my direct question, do you think there might be some more cuts coming down in this session? Well, we've cut $77 million now uh, currently. That's what will roll out next school year. That's just under 5%. So that's a real deal. And, and we've added money back into the Department of Health. Their cuts now are at about 5%. We realize because how this whole thing works. You know, budgets are people. That's where this flows to. It's not, uh, so it's the folks actually in this room, the Appropriations Committee are, are working hard at that and trying to find that right balance. Will we continue to work for efficiencies? Absolutely. I think one of our actions yesterday, we, we uh, made a, a motion as a committee to really tell our Department of Education, get with the folks on the ground, the bus drivers, the transportation workers, come back to us with ideas in the next two weeks to save money on transportation. Wanted to do this big study and take a year, and, and all the testimony we had from the people who are living it daily said, we can do this much quicker. We can come back to you with ideas. So I think 
that's just part of this whole problem solving. We can do this. I would say uh, every government in the world has budget issues. Nobody has unlimited funds. And every school district, every state in the union goes through this. And, uh, but nobody is in as good a shape as Wyoming. We've got challenges, there's no doubt. I mean, nearly 70% of our revenue comes from minerals. And you know, we're gonna continue to have this discussion out to broaden the, there's, you know, we're not necessarily the most business friendly tax state in the United States. But I, and the, I know the president talks all the time about broadening. And I think uh, we're gonna continue to have these discussions, but we've got billions in trust funds, we've got billions saved in cash, and we have zero debt. So there's a lot of states we're the envy of. And so do we have challenges? Absolutely, but we're gonna, I think, use good Wyoming common sense, I call it, pay our bills and try to do it the right way. Let's talk about what this word broaden means. We <clears throat> talked about it off camera. We're in the Joint Appropriations Committee room where they've carved through the governor's budget over the last month or so. Just a moment ago, you both were down the hall in the Revenue Committee room. And oftentimes people believe, I think in this state, when you talk revenue, you're talking taxes. What does broaden the tax base exactly mean from each of you? Is, is that a finding new revenues or is it, is it well, different types of revenues? What, do, what does broaden it, the tax base It can base really mean? be broad. It's pretty simple and the, the, speaker, the speaker talked about it a little bit. Is you know, 70% of the revenues for this state have been derived from minerals. And the minerals industry, you know, oils come back and things are looking good, but the norm today is the way it will be for a while. We will not have the kind of boom to fund the levels that we spend in the state that we have now. It won't happen like it has in the past because there are a lot of outside forces that we didn't realize before. We still have the issues with access to our federal lands that really hurts us. But you know, we have these shale plays and the development of the minerals and oil and gas across our country. You know, it's a different marketplace right now. So when it comes back, it will not be to those levels. So how do we offset this 70% dependence on so, minerals? So what I hear you saying is that you perceive that we will have or do have a revenue issue. Is that Yes, accurate? we do. Absolutely okay. going to have it. And the good news is we've got the, the savings accounts to get us through this transition. But if we're truly going to fund government and K through 12 at these levels, and that's what we choose to do, as we transition, we're going to have to broaden i.e. tax other industries and other things besides minerals to pay for this. You know, you talk about that in Wyoming, you know, the average taxpayer pays $33,000 for services but receives $30,000 worth of services. Thank you, minerals. Minerals will not be able to do that as they have in the past, so we need to look at that. Like, tourism and recreation is a great thing for Wyoming. I, I, it's, I'm all on board, it's a good thing, it's a positive thing. We need to promote it all we can, but in reality, you know, what do they pay? And we've talked about a lodging tax to broaden our tax base. You know, we all go to other states and see what we pay for lodging taxes. Why not have some discussion about a statewide lodging well, tax to help? Morning. Well, that was, that was a different kind of tax. That was a leisure tax. But the statewide lodging tax is something we ought to talk about. Broadening our tax base, it's, it's not going to be easy. That and the diversification component we have to do, it's going to take time. But the governor's been, been very, has demonstrated some leadership in this. The speaker and I have signed on on this. Now's the time to try to make these moves and do this, but it's gonna take time. Mr. Speaker, we've, we've talked about last year about Wyoming's fiscal problems, and we talked about ideas to how to, to move forward on the revenue side. Um, you've watched the Revenue Committee. Both of you have been ex-official members of the Revenue Committee, um, worked through, meant more times than any Revenue Committee in history. And at the end of the day, it really hasn't produced much new revenue, really. So really, how do we study? How do we move forward? How do we execute? Yeah, that's a good question. I think uh, all this meeting time has not been in vain, though. I think there's an education process, not only in the legislature that has to take place, but really with the public, because the public's going to drive this. And, and um, so we just got to keep talking and working about the issue. There's some real problems that hinder development. I mean, I... I'm talking to a businessman last week, they're going to pull out of Wyoming, going to keep it in Kansas because this can't afford the way we tax it, which is, it makes no sense the way we do it. But uh, so I think we got to study those. Well, we have some, some expertise on our staff. We're part-time legislators. We're not like we all have a, a cadre <laughs> of folks working for us individually. We, but we really don't have that expertise to say, is this the best way? How are other states doing it? Can we do this more efficiently? Because the idea is to unleash business, and so you have that growth, and that generate. I mean, that's the old Reaganomics generates more revenue for government. 
And uh, that's what the current president's trying to do with his tax reductions. And so uh, we got to have those discussions. Are we doing this the right way? Because if lowest taxes in the United States meant economic growth or, or certain taxes at the lowest, we'd be the most prosperous economy in the world. And one has to ask why, why we're not. And we're going to talk about whether everyone um, is really on board with what growth means to Wyoming. Well, and that's a great subject, it but is. the other thing too is, you know, this is an opportunity. We talked about the efficiency study. Right. You know, that could add into this, like in K through 12, like, like the speaker talked about, maybe there's better ways to do these things to save money and still get the money out there to the kids. You could do it with government. You know, we can do a better job on our investments. You realize that if we did 50 or 75 basis points with our investments, the kind of money that would generate, so there's a lot of things because of this revenue situation that we can look at. It doesn't necessarily mean raising taxes, but if we do, we sure should have broadening of our tax base. We're out of time for this segment, but I want to first thank you both for, for coming on this Capital Outlook preview. You've both agreed to join us each and every week as Capital Outlook resumes in full on February 16th. We look forward to, um, to chatting with you both weekly. There's lots to talk about, and the session are, is going to generate more topics as well. And so for thank sure. you for coming today. Yeah, You're thanks welcome. for having thanks us. Thanks a lot. Thank you. We're going to now take a look at the government efficiency report that's been discussed a little bit here in a little more detail with Representative Joe McGuire and Senator Drew Perkins, both who participated in that effort. That's next here on Capital Outlook. Stay with us. It's our pleasure now to be joined by Senator Drew per Perkins and Representative Joe McGuire, both who sat on the um, Wyoming Government Spending and Efficiency Commission. And this is their product, and we're going to talk about their report now. Gentlemen, welcome to Capital Outlook. Thank you for having us. Thank you very much. You've had an opportunity since November 30th is when this was delivered to the governor to kind of digest what was in the government efficiency um, report. And what are your initial thoughts about what you discovered and whether or not there really are cost savings opportunities and efficiency opportunities for Wyoming government? Senator, let me start with you. I, first of all, I was very pleased with both the effort of the consultant as well as our uh, committee, which was comprised not only, you only had two legislators on it, uh, Joe McGuire and myself, and then uh, we had a number of citizen, uh, in, uh, uh, just people who were there uh, from around the state to helping us. And so ultimately it was actually uh, more and, uh, and more in depth and I appreciated uh, the scope of it. It was a lot more than I thought we would get in the short time period and the limited funding that we had available to undertake it. So I was very pleased with it. Representative McGuire, what were your initial thoughts? Well, I have to tell you, I started out as a real skeptic. In fact, I thought the speaker was punishing me for something. But uh, as I got into it and started listening to the testimony, uh, going back and forth with the consultants and finally seeing the report, I have to tell you I'm a real believer now. I think that uh, we're just scratching the surface with it. We've um, visited briefly with the leadership about the results of this report. Do you both believe, I mean, the, the um, low end of potential savings over by an M is $112 million, the high end is $227 million. Are those opportunities really there? Senator Perkins? So to what degree, I don't know that they're there. And those aren't, those aren't things that you go in and flip a switch and you have these savings in a day or two. Um, but there's a, there's a process that if you're willing to go through it that I think, yes, I think those savings are there. Not just for these consultants. We had, we've had uh, several presentations from people both on, who are competitively bidding to be the consultant for this initial study, as well as individuals who just came and talked about it. And it's, it's been a fairly, uh, a fairly common estimate that you could save somewhere between four to five percent of your general fund dollars by going through one of these processes if you go back and implement them. When we have a, a general fund of not quite four billion, you know, you're talking about 160 or so million dollars. So the estimates we're getting are very consistent with what you find consultants who do these types of things and find these successes, uh, of course, they always come with the same caveat here on TV about past performance is no indicator of future, for future performance. But uh, if you look historically what's been happening, yes, I think they're realistic. Representative, do you, do you believe in these numbers? Uh, I believe in the numbers in a general sense, and you have to look at it like the carrot and the stick. Uh, people, human nature, if you go in with a stick, you're not going to get the type of savings that they're looking and, and trying to show us. You have to incentivize people and you have to reward them for making those savings. 
Um, everybody's familiar with government and big companies and even small companies. There are always inefficiencies and there are always things that just happen because that's the way we've always done it. Um, I worked for the government for a small amount of time and you know, there was no reward to try and go out and be more efficient or to save money. You have to incentivize people if you want to get those results. I think a valid question might be for um, <clears throat> those of us who have now watched the legislature cut general fund um, budgets and that for administrators and directors who have had to endure these cuts, why aren't we already efficient? Why, why do we have more efficiencies to realize when we've been through this budget cutting process? Yeah, it's a very good question. I think, in some respects, <clears throat> it's it's the nature, it's the nature of government. Um, if you look at the end of the day, if you go into private business, you go even go into well-run um, nonprofits, they have a bottom line they need to address in order to accomplish their mission. So they focus on what is their mission and how do we accomplish that, and how do we maintain and pay for what we're doing, and how do we do that. So there's a natural. There's a natural tendency through that organizational structure to, to lend itself to more efficiencies and how to do that because when you when you when you gain efficiencies, there's essentially everybody everybody's rewarded. In government, it's oftentimes it's not that. The opposite is it's not so much on the mission uh, and 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 how to have a bottom line, but it is I have this work to do and I need this much money to do it. And in some cases, those those. Uh, in some cases, those programs are regulatorily driven. In some cases, their direct legislative dynamics or, or, or orders or directives that they go out and do a program. And so, in some, so when you when when th that happens, a lot of times there is not a significant amount of feedback or, or or back to have an analysis to find out whether you're effective or efficient in any way, because you're simply following a legislative or regulatory directive that requires that. So well, some, many times it's not a consideration. Representative, you looked at um, not only um, opportunities for um, increasing efficiencies now, but also in the future. And you also only reviewed major agencies of over $20 million budget or more. So there's really more work to do. Is that an accurate statement as far as reviews like, like this should continue? I think that's accurate and I think that you have to approach it and do it incrementally. You can't just go out and flip a switch uh, and all of a sudden every agency is going to start saving X number of dollars. You have to go out and, and you have to start out with a focus and you have to help those agencies to make some changes and then you have to incrementally build on that. So it, it's, a, it's a program, it has to be a program. You now have, have um, um, mentioned savings that can occur across government with ANI, with administration and information, with the Department of Health, with the Department of Education, with revenue and audit. Where does the leadership come to implement better efficiencies? Is it all legislative based? Does it require buy-in from um, administrators and directors? How, does, how do we get from where we are today to what is recommended? Um, that's, that's that's a great question, and in fact, one of the things that I did as I put this together, as I as I was put it, working on this bill, because I, I was the prime sponsor on this legislation a year ago, um, one of the things as you put it together and, and look at what's going on in other states, I actually I actually took the time, particularly after we got started, to talk with those states and and who had been through this, who had started this process. Some had done it successfully, some not as not as successfully. What was the difference? And the difference is is leadership across both branches of government. In executive, Kansas, executive and legislative, is that correct? Mm -hmm. uh, correct, and so we, uh, in doing that, for example, if we're talking to the speaker in Kansas who went, underwent this, what you had is it was a legislatively driven, uh, it was a legislative driven program. The, the, the administrative branch wasn't, the executive branch wasn't very interested in it, and ultimately, particularly after a change in government, it fizzled right out. You go to Louisiana, they absolutely panned the effort down there. It was ta undertaken during Jindal, and uh, Jindal left, and the new governor absolutely hated it. The, 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 the subsequent legislature uh, regretted what, there was actually a significant change in leadership there too, I believe, and they, they didn't like what was done, and so it was essentially almost scrapped. Well, Senator, we're at the doorstep of a new governor. Is that a concern of yours? Well, and so this is what, the way we structured it, we, we did it a little bit differently. 
Like I said, we a concern about having a not legislative driven. The only two legislators that are on the commission are Representative McGuire and me. Um, we wanted to have a governor appointee. We had a, 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 the governor or executive branch appointed a private citizen to serve on it. Um, we had we included the judiciary branch. We made them non-voting because they may have to rule on the efficacy of something at some point. So we don't want them making decisions in that. But then we had the legislative branch and the legislative. Uh, folks appointed also a private citizen. So in doing that, we tried to bring that on. And I think the timing on this is really important because I think that as you look at, as if you, if you read and understand this, Governor Meade is, I keep my message from him and direct question to Governor Meade is, do you want to do this? Are you on board? Is this, is a, this is the beginning of a heavy lift in your last year of your administration. He says, absolutely. I mean, this is the right way to go. And I think as you talk with with folks who are running, who are, who are talking about running for governor, they're very interested in it. And it's an opportunity to, to both be a, a, a continuing legacy from Governor Meade and the beginning of a long lasting and, and significant legacy for the next governor to come in and do this because it's so overdue and, and it's just a prime time to do it. And if we can do it, can, if we do it consistently and together and provide that leadership together and continue to have that cooperation across the branches, I think will be, we have the ability to be very successful because of joint leadership. Representative McGuire, what's your, what, what do you think? Well, I agree with that and, and I think the most important thing, and again, I work for the state of Wyoming, so I'm on board. I think that we've got some of the best people working for the state of Wyoming in any state of the union. And honestly, the best leaders go down to the people who are on the ground actually doing the work and help them to do their job better. And if you were to go down to that level, everybody who works for the state of Wyoming knows where they can save money. If you were to incentivize them and reward them to do that and give them the authority to do it, I think that the savings would be much further than what you see in that report. And that is one of the suggestions that this report um, points out maybe a governor's idea fair is what what it talks about. Is it your perception that you do have support from administrators today and directors today? I think it varies from agency to agency. Does that concern you? It does. But what, it was it was very interesting. When we had our first meeting in uh, in the summer down in Cheyenne. We had our first meeting and the agencies came before us and one by one they pretty much said uh, what we had talked about a little bit earlier, which was, you know, we've been through the budget cuts. Um, they interpreted efficiency to be more budget cuts, and they said, we've been cut all we can, please don't cut us anymore, we just can't absorb anything. So other than that, leave us alone, and, and we're trying to be efficient, by the way. And so then, once the consultants came in and did their whirlwind um, survey, and did their questions with the agencies, as they came back, when we had our second meeting in Casper, and the agencies came back and reported, there were still some skeptic, uh, all, all of them basically said they supported it. Um, in varying degrees of enthusiasm, but the, the, there was a difference. One, they recognized that the consultants that we brought in knew what they were talking about. For example, the Department of Health said, it was so nice to talk to a consultant who understood Medicaid. And, uh, and so they looked at, and also the, the, the consultants were very quick to recognize that there's some, there's some areas and some zones of excellence already in our government. Uh, a number of things that our Department of Health does, they said they're national leaders. People ought to be coming to Wyoming to see what Director Forslund and Department of Health has done, with, have done with their dashboard and their, their use of, of data and statistics. One of the recommendations is now that Medicaid does not need, be, need to be further studied because of what's happening in Wyoming. Right. Do you expect some um, budgetary support in this legislature to begin to implement some of these uh, changes, Representative McGuire? I think we'll have good support from leadership. And the reason that leadership encouraged this study and, and in fact put it into place was because they want to protect people's jobs. They understand that budgets are dollars and those dollars go to pay people and, and those people are our neighbors. So they're trying to do this to make things better and protect people's jobs and, and help us move along and be more efficient. So. Senator Drew Perkins, the Majority Floor Leader of the Senate, and Representative Joe McGuire, thank you so much for joining us. This is a, a movement that will follow through not only this legislative session, but I believe through sessions to come. Thank you so much for joining us on Capital Outlook. It's our pleasure, thank you.
We're back in the Joint Appropriations Committee hearing room here in the temporary capital of the Wyoming Legislature in the Jonah Building. We want to transition now to a profile we shot earlier this month with the Vice President of the Senate, Senator Michael Van Flatern from Gillette. I think his views on Wyoming's low taxes may surprise you. Stay with us. It's our pleasure now to be joined on this Capital Outlook profile with Senator Michael Van Flatern from Gillette, um, representing Senate District 24. Senator, you've been in public service in the legislature since 20, uh, 2005. You made the decision to run again in 2016. Why did you want to run again? Well, I decided to run again because we need the continuity for one thing. We need the continuity and there was projects I had not completed yet, which we are slowly getting some of the uh, Passing lanes done on 59, that was a big issue when I first ran. Uh, I think we've finished all the passing lanes we're going to do. There's a uh, Garner Lake Road, which is going to be, we assume, the new Highway 59 going north out of Gillette. Uh, and that took some, what I would believe would be AML money, uh, Bend and Mine Land money. Uh, it turned out that we'd kind of spend the, spent all the AML money, so um, we found some other money which cost us a couple passing lanes south of uh, Bill to Douglas on Highway 59 and we used that money to build this, uh, well, in the next two or three years you'll get this new Garner Lake Road extension, they call it. You came to Gillette, you're not a, a Wyoming native, but it's, the, it's work, the coal mines that brought you here. Yes, they did. In fact, I started out as a welder in the oil field for a year or so year and a half and then I went to the coal mines for a couple three years and then I went back as a contractor a welding contractor for the coal mines for the next 18 years and pretty much concentrated there a little oil field but pretty much concentrated in coal mining. But you had a passion for flight. Yes about uh, 30 almost 30 years ago I started uh, flying and I took lessons in Gillette it's a great airport to take lessons because it does have a tower and it does have all your uh, approaches um, for the instrument landing systems that you would need to practice and to get good at learning how to talk on a radio which is one of the great fears of every student is having to actually talk on a radio to somebody else that's you know in a tower. You can't Facebook a, a message post no, to the tower down the road. You can't text them as you're going. You, Although today if you know his cell number you can text them. Uh, so, uh, so it was a great place to learn and we were expanding into Nevada in doing the gold mines there as far as, you know, uh, welding. And so, uh, you know, I built my hours going back and forth to Nevada. And eventually when I sold that business, I got it my commercial license and then we built into this. So when you're flying up, um, you're a pilot. Yes. Um, uh, when you're flying in one of your planes and you look down at Wyoming and you understand very well that Wyoming is subsidized today about to the tune of 70% by the energy industry. What do you see in 10 years? You've worked with Endow, you've, you've kind of contemplated what our future is now and, and probably always have. 10 years from now, 20 years from now, what's Wyoming gonna be like? Well, Wyoming has to change its attitude about how it funds itself and how it's perceived by the outer, outside world. We are doing things in Gillette that are going to sustain coal, but at a lesser, uh, production quant or production. So we're going to go from, we were at peaked in 2012, I think at 420 million and we're around 300 million now. And so that's the new norm. So for the next 10 years, we'll probably sustain that. But if you want to diversify the economy and get us away from this boom and bust, which we, by the way, we were talking earlier and this last 15, 16 years were the longest boom we've probably ever experienced in the state of Wyoming. So we went about 15 years with really good revenue and uh, it was all minerals. It was 70% minerals. Um, if we want to diversify, if we want to uh, attract new businesses and your low taxes will not do it. That's not what you can Have we learned there. that finally, Senator? I don't know that, any, that we've learned it as a state, but I can guarantee you that low taxes work well for the billionaires 
that move to Jackson and build a home for 20 or 30 million dollars because they're getting out of a high tax state like California. But for an, a corporation to come here and say, well, yeah, you depending on your mineral industry, but the mineral industry is going downward a little bit. And so at one point, you're going to slap a tax on me. So what you're saying is, is that everyone else understands that painting. Well, you know, the, the economic development person in um, Garden City, Kansas, when I went on a tour of a wind farm, wind lay down yard, I guess you'd call it there, she said, nobody has ever said to me, it's your tax structure, it's your low taxes. She said, that is not a good argument. You don't want to promote yourself as just the lowest taxes. You want to say, I have the most stable tax structure. And that's what the corporations and in new industries are looking for. They're looking for a stable tax structure. They know the other shoe's gonna drop someday and it's gonna drop on them. It's an interesting perspective because we hear every year from the governor, we are open for business. Our taxes are low. We hear when the leaders of the legislature talk that our taxes are low, among the lowest in the country. You hear people from all over Wyoming say that. And yet, here we are today really wondering, are we at the tipping point? Are we, is our reliance on minerals in the end, even if we can sustain somewhat of a mineral industry, gonna, gonna really hurt us? It will hurt us because we go through the boom and bust. As I said, the last 15 years were the best we've ever, longest period of time. Uh, I've been through three busts in my 30 years and the longest one was the last 15 years. So you have to understand that, um, my, I guess I've been here 40 years, but you have to understand that um, we can't, we have to diversify our tax structure, our tax base. We need to spread that out. And if it means that an inventory tax, let's say, has to go on corporations or companies, we need to do that now. We need not to say, come to our state, we have the lowest taxes, and once we get them here, we'll nail you with a big new tax. They're smarter than that. They know that that, that probability exists. And so it, I look at it as a detriment. I may be a my, small minority in this state, but I do look as a detriment to say to a corporation, come, you know, a, a Saturn, a Tesla, um, a, a whatever, come to my state and set up this 400 person factory. And then I get you here, oh, I can, now get another five million out of you this year. And will you stay? Awful question to have to ask down the road. I wanna get back to airplanes. You, uh, you gave a great story for those of us that were um, in the audience at the State of Aviation Summit that we had last year about a dog and a pilot. T -t Tell us that story. The future cockpit in every aircraft because we, I think the, com the conversation was uh, was formed by the fact of the autonomous airplane, which we all know will be, um, someday drones will be delivering packages, I guess is what Amazon's claim is. So the future cockpit of the world will be a pilot and a dog. And the pilot's there to feed the dog. And the dog's there to bite the pilot if he touches anything. And that is really true because the people in the back will never feel comfortable. I don't think they'll feel comfortable in the next 50 years of nobody up front in the cockpit. So they'll put this human in there, but somebody on the ground and the computers are controlling the aircraft and truly the dog will be there to bite him if he touches anything. You gonna fly in one of those planes? Will you be a passenger? Oh, I'd be a passenger today. I mean, I think it's detrimental to my future or my future of this company, but it's perfect for, uh, there's nothing you could, you could make, a, there's nothing about flying that could not be done by a computer today and drones have proved that. So yes, you could have one person handling six or eight jetliners easily. When you think about technology, you think that young people might be able to grasp that a little more clearly than us older folks. And I guess back to Wyoming's future. Where, where do we sit in our ability to provide younger folks who will be wanting to stay here? Something different than hunting and fishing and those things that really appeal to us and to our generation that may not be as appealing to younger kids who want to be part of a high-tech world that develops autonomous planes or cars or um, uh, changes the way we deliver our energy grid, for example. 
how, how, do we, how do we make that bridge for those folks? You know, there's, there's a couple of towns that are trying that here, uh, a Cheyenne or a Laramie, because they're close to the front range and they can start to make that transition. Uh, Cheyenne and Laramie haven't conquered the livable space where you can walk to work and you can uh, walk down to the stadium and watch your pro football teams or your pro baseball teams or hockey. Uh, but at least they can drive to Denver and see that same thing. This state's population is hurting it in the, that way because we're so low populated um, that it's hard for us to create. Lander has sort of created the working, the walking environment. If you don't mind the weather, you know, it just gets cold, but it, um, they at least have the walking area. You can move downtown. But when you go to uh, the rest of these towns, they're all built around automobiles. So the cultural aspect is what attracts the young and the population would be needed to start with to attract the, the sports teams or to get the clubbing, uh, the nightlife to be there for, the, for those that are in the 20s, or we're, we're hoping they're in the 20s anyway. Mm -hmm. um, so I think our low population is gonna be a, always be a detriment to our state. The outdoor living, the um, hunting, fishing, snowmobiling, we already have that conquered and we're one of the best at it, but you know the rest of it is gonna be tough. Senator Ron Flatern, you have um, said before you want to model yourself and the way you lead, just like Senator Al Simpson. Why and um, are you able to? You know, I think I can, um, of course I'm next Al Simpson, <laughs> would anybody say? Uh, but the fact is that I think- A little think, taller than both of us, but- Yeah, yeah. he's, you know, physically I won't match him, but you know, otherwise I think I can. No, I really admire the gentleman because he, um, he seems to, especially in the last 10 or 15 years, really been nonpartisan. He's really gone and worked across the groups from the uh, LBG, uh, LB, LBGT? LBGTQ group um, all the way to the ultra conservative, no taxes. Um, so I think that I fit in there somewhere that I understand and sympathize with both groups. And that's what Al Simpson, in my mind, had, has been doing the last 20 years. He's been doing nothing but bridging that gap and taking the side of both sides in certain issues, whatever the issue happens to be. That's where I think I can match. Some have written, though, that maybe our legislature is becoming even more conservative. And I, you know, I do see that there is a, um, a group in the House, in the Senate, I'm not saying that either is better or worse, but uh, and the percentages are probably equal, but there is, uh, we are becoming more conservative, but it's, to, to the, for those that don't want anybody else in the state, that's probably the perfect scenario, but after all the time I spent on this and Dow Committee and for other, um, listening to other people, I really think that Wyoming needs to wake up and join the rest of the nation. Senator Michael Von Flater and the Vice President of the Senate, it's an interesting session. Thank you very much for spending time with us on Capital Outlook. I'm glad you came here and to our beautiful hangar. And it is beautiful and I should tell our viewers we're in Casper and you operate um, your um, service in Casper yes. and in Gillette. In Gillette, exactly, thank you. Senator, best wishes. All right, thanks. And as we conclude our preview to the 2018 budget session, now it's our pleasure to be joined by the minority leadership of the Wyoming Senate and the Wyoming House, Senator Chris Rothfuss and Representative Kathy Conley. To you both, welcome back to Capital Outlook. Thanks. Thanks. I want to lead off with the reason this budget session is here. Two years ago, each of you voted against Wyoming's biennial budget. You've heard now summaries just today, as a matter of fact, on the work the Joint Appropriations Committee has done. Um, what tenants will need to be in place for this budget to get your positive vote? Senator, let me start with you. I would like to see a lot of the programs that are people oriented restored and see some improvements in funding levels uh, over what we did a couple of years ago. Uh, we were draconian two years ago in our cuts. There wasn't a lot of precision. Uh, I don't think there was a, a lot of thought that went into what programs were cut, how much they were cut, and we ended up doing things that will cost 
the state a great deal of money in the long term just to trim the bottom line at that point in time. Uh, for example, cutting programs within corrections that, that preclude future sexual assaults. That, there is money that's been restored investment. now. Mm -hmm. There is. And so I would say we were correct. Yes, um, exactly. And are thinking that there are really important programs that serve people in the state and also serve things like public safety when it comes to the cuts to the Department of Corrections that now have been put back again. You know, you don't cut money to a successful sex offender rehabilitation program and not expect for there to be negative outcomes. Um, you don't cut money for substance abuse prevention when we know, we know that those programs were successful. And without them, it means in the DOC, for example, that you're going to be putting people back out on the streets who still have addiction issues, who are going to commit other crimes, recidivate, and end up back in prison. That just doesn't make sense. We cut too much money out of, we, we cut prevention programs all over the state when it comes to suicide, alcohol, and substance abuse. We cut early literacy programs. Those all serve kind of our, our important segments of our population and that those needed to be restored. Senator and Representative, you both also have set through what's called recalibration. <clears throat> and you've, you've been down this road before. Um, what did you learn? We charge them with taking a look at our education funding model in a different way than we did in the past five and ten years. We used an evidence-based model and consultants that did this did that kind of program. We asked these these consultants to come up with a model based on a prof professional judgment panel and successful schools. They did it, and they came up with 50 to 90 million more dollars that we would need to spend in order to implement the model that they came up with. So bottom line, we understand that we are funding education appropriately right now. And in fact, we could add a little bit to it, not take away from it. So some people called it a Cadillac model. Certainly what these consultants came up with was no, it's not a Cadillac model. And in fact, there's even areas that we could expand on and improve on. Senator, do you, do you agree with that assessment? Absolutely. So areas like English language learners, uh, at-risk populations, we're not spending enough money. That was identified. But we knew that before. That, that was something that we would talked about at the previous recalibration as well. Uh, we've heard emphasis time and again on early childhood education as being an area where the state of Wyoming falls uh, drastically short of target. And these consultants, our previous consultants, uh, have indicated to us that if we want to invest in, in a higher quality education system, that's where we should be putting our dollars. So we, we did learn a lot from this recalibration, a fresh was set of eyes. I do think it was worth it. it. It gave us some additional insight into, again, areas where we can improve, uh, gave us some potential mechanisms on how we can improve. But really the fact that it corroborated our current model because the answers were comparable, the total funding was comparable, uh, that tells us that we're about right. We're in the ballpark of where we should be spending and there are some areas that we can focus on to do better. But the reality is we're just kicking the can down the road for another two years. And actually, Senator Rothfuss and I have been talking about that, and that just isn't the solution. And so we have a couple of ideas, including a, co a comprehensive tax reform bill that we'll be introducing. How can you expect that that would get any support from the majority? It's not so much about support at this point in time as really trying to get a conversation started that's realistic about the future of Wyoming. Let me interject here. How come that conversation wasn't the catalyst of that wasn't two years ago when you all knew um, that we had drastic funding deficits at the time. Well, it's a great question, and, and there were some beginnings to conversations at that point. Uh, if that had continued, we probably would be looking at some, some actual revenue coming out of the, the revenue Would you be committee. looking at revenue or more cuts? Both. There'd be conversation about revenue, and there'd be conversation about cuts. And there are legislators that, under no circumstance, will they ever support new revenue. And, and that's a problem. Uh, they, they desire the cuts, and, the, and they believe less government is going to be better. That's a challenge that, that we face in, in the best or worst of times. But there are many legislators that realize that there are important government uh, responsibilities that have to be met and those are the ones that we're we're hoping will will take this seriously and recognize that
counting on the next boom with a mineral-based economy, it's hopeful, and I realize that, that we've, we've come out of the bottom and moved up, but the reality is we're moving up because we're expecting massive returns from our investments. We're, we're banking on the stock market at this point to bail us out. Mm -hmm. uh, nobody projects in the long term that the stock market is going to continue to behave this way. It can't. So what happens then? What happens when we have an economic downturn uh, nationally, stock market crashes, and we're banking on 20% of our revenues to come from great returns on capital gains? You both support the governor's, governor's Endow initiative. Is that accurate? It's true. Yeah. I mean, but for me, there were two elements to it. One is that we have to really diversify our revenue streams as related to diversifying the economy. I mean, just what Senator Rothfuss just said right now. It's big talk, right, to bring in data centers and another weather bee, but it's meaningless unless we make it meaningful in terms of the revenue streams that come into the state and what the expenses are for having, for having new companies here. But there's another element as well. To me, the Endow Initiative was a whole lot more about doing more of the same. It was really looking at how do we enhance what we have now, and that's a lot of talk about extractive industries and, manu and kind of a move towards manufacturing with you know, value added. I want to look at kind of outside the box as well as jobs that employ both men and women. And so I'd like to see the initiative go further into thinking about good jobs that traditionally women hold as well as jobs that men hold and to look at jobs as well as, as kind of just bringing in new companies. And I've supported the efforts of the governor for Endow all along and have been working with him on the economic development initiatives uh, since he's been working on them. But the whole time I, I've, I've been adamant about the fact that you can't just do the economic development without diversifying the tax base. So I certainly support Endow and the concept of it, but it would be a tragic nightmare if we were incredibly successful with Endow but didn't change our tax structure. And we absolutely want to bring in companies <clears throat> that bring in jobs for families and ha grow our communities with, absolutely. yeah. I want to ask you before we go and um, start really digging into the work that you have to do in the month in front of you in the budget session about the government efficiency report. Our viewers just saw um, Senator Perkins and Representative McGuire talk about it and the potential for up to $220 million of efficiencies that might be gained, best case, <clears throat> if all of the recommendations were implemented. Um, after budget cuts that have already been in place, do you believe that those efficiencies are still there to be gained and I perceive that it might have some support from the legislature, it have support from the executive branch. Do the administrators in Wyoming support this work? What's your feeling about that? Only if they don't have to do it without the resources to do it. So one of the things about the efficiency study, it said is that you need to invest a little bit. A little, spend a right? little money to save a lot of right? money. Right, mm -hmm. and it's so easy for the legislature to say, ah, we're not gonna do that part. And so if we don't fund the ability to do it and do it correctly and just put it on current administrators and say, oh, by the way, we're going to add that to your, to your plate, it won't happen and it won't happen well. And there won't be the support that's needed. And I do needed. believe the report suggested that there would be an initial outlay of money. Yeah, but that's the part I'd be concerned about. Senator? Yeah, it, there, there are certainly going to be some aspects of the report that, that do bear out, uh, but a lot of the time, Efficiency trades off with efficacy, and my concern is that we'll be looking for ways to look efficient on paper when the reality is we're not performing the same services and we're not providing the same um, offers to the, to the public. And, and with the amount of draconian cuts, the number of cuts that we've done in recent years, there's just not that much more there to ring out through additional efficiencies. So yes, if we invest, we know we can be more efficient. But oddly enough, what we talked about a, a few minutes ago, if we invested in programs that prevented crime, we would have less crime, we would save money on corrections, we know Early that. education, right, we talked right. about. If we, invest, if we put money, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. If we put money into preschool, we know the evidence is that we will have less expenses when it comes to special ed, we'll have higher graduation rates, but we have to have that you know, five, 10, 20 year vision. 
and I'm not even talking about prison at the end of that without providing those kinds of services. You know, that's an investment. That's much better efficiency. Yeah. But it costs a lot of money now to get that efficiency. Uh, you, you think about the prison in the future. We, we're looking at building more prison beds. We're going to spend millions of dollars to do that uh, rather than just try to reform the criminal justice system and find ways to divert from, from prison. But we that's know, an expense. Yeah, we know that in intensive supervised probation, redoing um, probation and parole rather than a new prison makes a whole lot of sense. We have the ability to be innovators when it comes to criminal justice reform in the nation. And we have just chosen not to go down that road and instead set up a savings can, a new coffee can, right, for funding for a new prison. That's I think the director's been well noticed, though, um, with the work that he's done in, in Wyoming's um, um, Absolutely, and, and he would be the first person to say that the programs that were cut a couple of years ago will we'll take him off of that <laughs> list of, that of highly <laughs> performing uh, directors. But you, you look at other efficiencies. We know that if we consolidated schools and school districts, we would save money. That's more efficient. That's not going to happen. Politically, it's untenable. We could collapse entire counties where we have redundant resources being used in small counties around the state collapse them into more efficient districts. One of the recommendations is regional regional administrative centers. Exactly. Four of them for Wyoming. Those are those sound great on paper, but good luck going to those counties and selling to them. You don't need to be able to come to your city and do your work with the county. You're going to need to travel to the local administrative center, which That's we're going to place in someone else's county. Yeah. So Again, things can look pretty good on paper, but politically they're a little more challenging. It's always a pleasure to visit with both of you. This is going to be an exciting session. I'm sure we we'll, might have an opportunity to visit again. So thank you very Second. much for joining us. Absolutely. Okay. I want to remind our viewers, we'll take next Friday off, but then after the first week of the Wyoming Legislature, we'll be back on February 16th, and we urge you to join us then. So for all of us at Wyoming PBS, thanks for watching, and have a good evening. This program is supported in part by a grant from the BNSF Railway Foundation, dedicated to improving the general welfare and quality of life in communities throughout the BNSF Railway Service Area. Proud to support Wyoming PBS. And in part by the Wyoming Public Television Endowment and viewers like you.